We're talking now about alveolar surface tension, and I, I have those white pieces of paper now, okay? Uh, one of the things that we said earlier was that this structure, the alveolus, is made out of really delicate cells, simple squamous epithelial cells, and in order for them to stay alive, they need to be coated with a layer of water. They're also known as type 1 alveolar cells, and this one that's marked by the letter A is known as a type 2 alveolar cell. And the job of this cell is to make a substance called pulmonary surfactant. Pulmonary surfactant is not the name of a molecule, it's a mixture of molecules, and they are related to uh, phospholipid, and um, their job is to um, their job is to um, make sure that the alveolus doesn't collapse. Let me explain that to you. Now, in order to stay alive, the alveolus needs to have moisture inside of it, but that's a problem. So let's look at these pieces of paper. These pieces of paper are dry, and you can see that they touch and they go apart. And if I close my eyes, I actually can't tell when they're touching and when they're not touching because it doesn't take any extra effort uh, to peel them apart when they're dry. But water likes to stick to water. So now I've got basically the same pieces of paper, but they're wet. And now I do notice that it requires effort to peel them apart. And why is that? That has to do with surface tension. Water likes to stick to water. Now, the problem is that the alveolus it is wrapped in water and it's microscopically small. So there are times when the two sides are gonna get close enough together. And when they get close enough together, they're going to cling together like this. And in order to take our next breath, we would have to exert a little bit of effort in order to reopen or reinflate an alveolus. Now you might think to yourself, ah, you're not having that much trouble with the paper. How hard can it be? Well, inflating a single alveolus would be negligible, but you've got millions and millions of them in your lungs. So if all of your alveoli were collapsing with every breath that you took, the amount of effort that it takes to breathe would exhaust you within a very short amount of time. There are two very relevant medical applications for this. Let's start with our discussion of the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, the COVID-19 thing that's going around. One of the cells that this uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2, is attacking are these uh, type 2 alveolar cells. And that means that patients that have got a really bad infection with this coronavirus, and these cells are not as abundant as they need to be, so there is less pulmonary surfactant than there needs to be. So now when people are exhaling, some of their alveoli are collapsing, and it requires more effort to breathe. And one of the things that we will hear from patients that are very sick with uh, the coronavirus is that it's hard to breathe. It's hard for them to inhale. One of the reasons can be because of the absence of pulmonary surfactant. Uh, another way that this is relevant, you may have uh, known uh, someone who had a child that needed to be born before a full pregnancy was accomplished. And we call those kids premature infants. Uh, premature infants, one of the problems that they have is that their lungs are not fully developed. What do we mean by not fully developed? Well, one of the things that can happen in premature infants is that these cells, the type two alveolar cells, they haven't started making this substance pulmonary surfactant yet. You know, keep in mind, you're a baby, you're in your mom for seven months, you had two more months before you got to start worry, worrying about that breathing thing. So when you're only seven months inside of your mom, these cells are not making that substance pulmonary surfactant yet. They don't start making it until a few weeks before the baby is going to be born. So when, when children are born very prematurely, um, when they are born before or taken by cesarean section before uh, the uh, type two alveolar cells have begun making pulmonary surfactant, then they will have a tremendous amount of trouble breathing. Premature infants that were born back when I was born, uh, they had almost no chance of surviving, um, but we figured out pulmonary surfactant. And then a really smart doctor figured out a way to trick 
those premature babies' lungs into making surfactant early. So if we know that a baby needs to be taken by cesarean section early, we can give the mom an injection of a corticosteroid. And then if we can just keep the baby cooking inside of the mom for another 24 hours, when the baby is taken by cesarean section, their lungs are more likely to be making pulmonary surfactant and their chances of surviving being born early dramatically increase. So two reasons to understand about um, pulmonary surfactant. One more thing about uh, alveoli and staying open. Surfactant is necessary for alveoli to stay open, but so is that substance residual volume. And let me remind you from your uh, uh, 151 lab, that residual volume, that's the volume of air that remains in your lungs, even when you've exhaled as much as you possibly can. When I exhale as much as I can, pushing it all out, there's always going to be some air left in my lungs. That's residual volume. Some of that residual volume is keeping your alveoli propped open. So two things. So let me remind you again about the composition of air. The air around us is about 79% nitrogen. Nitrogen is a benign, non-toxic gas. We're glad that it's there. We're also glad that the oxygen is there, but quite frankly, happy that it's only 21%. And air has almost no carbon dioxide around us. Uh, we, we know now that the reason that giving your patient 50% oxygen to breathe or 80% oxygen to breathe, the reason that can help some patients is because it will increase the concentration gradient of oxygen, which will speed the rate of diffusion from the alveolus into the blood going by. And if the alveolar, the respiratory membrane is thickened because of inflammation or pneumonia, that that can make your patient's blood be 100% oxygenated in spite of that thickened respiratory membrane. Let's talk about some more uh, medical terms, okay? We talked about pulse oximetry. Let's talk about these three related medical terms. Term number one, dyspnea. Dyspnea, it's spelled really weird, Why D-Y-S-P-N-E-A, silent P, dyspnea. Um, dyspnea means air hunger or trouble breathing. If a patient comes to you and says, doc, I feel like I can't catch my breath, even without you running any tests, you know that that patient has dyspnea because they just told you, I'm having trouble breathing, right? Um, dyspnea is also something that you can observe in your patients. If your patient has been sitting quietly waiting for you for 10 or 15 minutes, and when you walk into their exam bay, you can see their then you are noticing dyspnea. It's not normal for patients that are completely at rest to be visibly demonstrating effort at breathing. So that's dyspnea. Let's talk about hypoxia. Hypoxia is low blood oxygen levels. In, in healthy young patients, blood oxygen levels that are lower than 95% can be considered hypoxia. Certainly below 90% is hypoxia. Um, Hypoxia is something that we actually need to measure unless it's extreme. And I wanna make this point really clearly that your patient can be having significant dyspnea and not have hypoxia. If your patient says, doc, I am really having trouble breathing, but you measure their blood oxygen levels and their blood oxygen levels are 98%, 98%. Does that mean they're not dyspneic? No, it doesn't. It means that all the extra effort that they are using to be able to breathe is working still, okay? There are plenty of patients that have got this COVID-19 thing that they come into the ER and they're really having trouble breathing. But right now, their pulse oximetry is reading 96%. You're happy about that, but it doesn't mean that they're not having dyspnea. It means that all the extra effort they're putting into is still allowing them to cope with whatever's going on. Let's talk about cyanosis. Cyanosis is a blue color to your patient's uh, skin or to any area of your patient's skin. Uh, if your entire patient is starting to look bluish, then you know that they are severely hypoxic. 
because blood doesn't have that blue appearance to it when we look at it through the skin. It doesn't look that way unless, pulse, uh, unless the hypoxia is profound. So if a patient is dyspneic, is cyanotic, you know they're profoundly hypoxic. Here's another use for the word cyanosis. It is possible for just one part of the body to be cyanotic. Whenever patients come in after a severe accident or with uh, one side of their body feeling weak or something like that, you always want to look at like the colors of the palms of their hands and the colors of the soles of their feet to make sure that they are the same color, right? If one hand is starting to look kind of blue, then that hand might be cyanotic. And that mean, could mean that there is an obstruction of blood supply to that arm. These are all related concepts in the world of medical respiratory terms, and I want you to know how they are different. Let me remind you that alveolar gas exchange is just a matter of diffusion. Oxygen is diffusing from the air into the blood at the level of the alveolus, and carbon dioxide is diffusing from the blood into the air at the level of the alveolus, right? Now, it's not like all of the oxygen enters it, it just goes to an equilibration state. And it's not like all of the CO2 leaves, it just goes to the point of equilibration. A long time ago, when we were first talking about blood, I told you that organisms that are multicellular, that have a cardiovascular system, that we needed to invent a molecule that could carry oxygen. And the reason that multicellular organisms all had to invent a molecule like hemoglobin is because oxygen does not dissolve well in water. Oxygen is hydrophobic. And since oxygen is hydrophobic, it's all, almost all of it is trapped on the hemoglobin, which is confined to the inside of red blood cells. Okay. Oxygen is not very soluble in water, so we need hemoglobin to get it from our lungs to our tissues. It's almost all there. So if I were here and I was looking for oxygen, the oxygen is hidden down inside of that red blood cell and it is attached to a molecule of hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide, CO2, is very soluble in water. Most of it is in the form of bicarbonate. I think that's a question on the exam. Bicarbonate is here in, mostly inside of the plasma and it's very soluble. So let's imagine that I am a chemoreceptor cell and it is my job to be testing the blood, tasting the blood. And it's my job to decide when it is time for you to take your next breath. I have got a problem, right? So I'm a chemoreceptor cell. Let me just be a chemoreceptor cell, a blue, okay? I'm a chemoreceptor cell, and as a chemoreceptor cell, I've got my little chemoreceptor, the end of my little chemoreceptor self, kind of like my tongue, and I've got it sticking out in there. How easy is it for me, as a chemoreceptor cell, to measure how much oxygen there is in your blood. It's almost impossible. Why? Because the oxygen's hidden from me. How easy is it for me to detect how much carbon dioxide is in the blood? Super easy. Why? It's dissolved in the form of bicarbonate. Okay? Since it's dissolved in the form of bicarbonate, it's really easy for me to detect that. That concept, how soluble molecules are in water, is the underlying trick to understanding how it is that your brain decides when it times for you to take a next breath. And we will start that at the beginning of our next video.